Hey folks, Dave Temple here. As you know, my podcast is all about talking to some of the best thriller writers in the world. But now, after nearly two and a half years, I think it's time I toot my own horn. So with that, I'm offering my thriller, The Poser, for sale. This thriller stars Hollywood detective Patricia Pat Norelli, a rookie cop working the overnight beat when one of Hollywood's biggest stars is found dead in her Hollywood Hills home. The only problem, the star just won an Oscar and is found dead only hours later. Now, Pat sees this as a way to forge her own path and muscles her way into the case. Soon, she and partner Detective Stuart Brown find themselves deep inside a complex case with more questions and answers and a ghost of a killer. Now, this isn't my first self-published book, but it's the first one I'm very confident you're going to like. I'm pretty proud of it. And for the rest of this month, you can get the ebook for only $5.95 or the paperback for $13.95. Now, since I do this weekly podcast as a free service, perhaps you'd consider this a way to help out your fellow thriller author. Okay, here's the link. DavidTempleBooks.com slash books. Okay, there you'll see the poser. Just click and you're on your way. Again, the link is DavidTempleBooks.com slash books. Otherwise, just head over to Amazon. Okay, thanks for your support. And now on with the show. You know, I feel like I can write. So each book is not an attempt to prove that I actually you know, and sit down and, and craft a story. I know I can do that. So now these are crafting stories that I want to read, that I enjoy writing and pushing um, my talent, you know, as limited as it may be, but pushing it into new places so that way it's still enjoyable to sit down and, and, and do it every day. Hello and welcome to The Thriller Zone. I'm your host, David Temple. Thank you so much for joining this podcast. It is a lot of fun. I hope you find it to be the same. On today's show, we've got a very special friend. It was one year ago that J. Todd Scott joined the show. Now, J. Todd Scott has written a new book called The Flock. We were talking about Lost River a year ago. It's cool to know that one year has gone by, hard to believe, and we get to talk to him again. So, without any further ado, let's head on into the green room and meet J. Todd Scott right here on The Thriller Zone. Happy anniversary, Todd. It was <laughs> one year ago. One year ago. One year ago that we hooked up on the show. Yep. Can you believe that? I know. It's hard to believe that time has gone by so fast, right? Uh, part of it's cool. I was saying to my wife, as she, I would got off the bike and then she got on and she was. I was like, man, can you believe it was one year ago today, J. Todd Scott and I got on the Thriller Zone, and uh, I went back and watched it this morning before I went on my ride. And uh, no, if you wait. if you asked me how long it would have been, I would have said, "Oh, I, I think it's been like I don't know, sixty, maybe ninety days, maybe maybe three months, four yeah. months." No, time flies when you're having fun. And look how we're 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 as dead sexy as we ever were. I don't know about that. And this last year has aged me, I think. At the opening of the show last year, you were telling me that you'd just taken your DEA exam and you uh, and your doctor said, well, your weight has increased and your vision has decreased. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. All, all true. And how has it changed? Because you, you must have just had your checkup recently or about to yeah yeah no uh, my vision has continually deteriorated but fortunately my weight hasn't gotten much worse so i guess that's not i guess that's not too bad <laughs> <laughs> look at our age any victory is a good victory right <laughs> <laughs> isn't that the truth no i mean it really is so yeah going back and looking at that show i was like wow i i look i look younger and that was just a year ago and yeah, no, Todd it, looks exactly the same. What the hell? Yeah, just as old. I mean, that's so, you know, it, it's amazing how much gray and stuff has started to come in. And, uh, you know, I, the nice lady cuts my hair. I keep telling her to try to make me look younger, but she's like, I can only do so much with what you're giving me. So, <laughs> all right. Well, okay. <laughs> now, were you out at BoucherCon? Did you get back from that? Did you go? I did not go to Bowser Con. I went to Thriller Fest, and uh, between us girls, it ate up all my cash. Going New York City's expensive, boy. No, it, it's very, 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 very expensive. And I didn't do either this year. Um, just the the workload and everything else was, was too much. Um, 
you know, generally I, I think I can handle about anything, but this year between the DEA work, uh, working on that TV thing that I was working on, trying to get my next book after the flock turned in, which I've actually late turning it in. I just turned it in um, last week. It's the first time I've ever been late turning in a book, but um, I was about a month late. So, And that, if my memory serves, is about, was, it, was this your sixth book? Uh, yeah, what I just turned in will be my sixth. Yeah. We're going to talk about that in a second, but we, uh, we might as well just jump right into the flock. By the way, dude, the flock, this cover, <sighs> you sent me a preliminary shot early on. I'm like, Todd, I don't know who did that, but that thing is beautiful. Yeah, no, it, it turned out really well. And I just have the, um, the final version now and it's, you know, it's basically the same. It's got a nice quote by Al Makatsu on the front there. Uh, but it really, really turned out well. Uh, the folks, good folks, Thomas and Mercer did a great job. Very happy with how it turned out. And, um, you know, it'll be out here in another few weeks, I guess. Yeah. Well, we're jumping on the bandwagon early because we're big Todd Scott fans. Hey, do me a favor and read me the Alma Katsu uh, quote because I don't have that on my book. Yeah, it says, you got the real deal right here, Alma Katsu. But what it actually, the whole thing says, it's all here. Doomsday cults, innocence and grifters, unexplainable phenomena, heartache and regret, a chance at redemption. What sets the flock above your average thriller is the absolute ring of authenticity from this 20 plus year career DEA agent. You got the real deal right here, Almakatsu. Uh, <laughs> doesn't get much better than that, does it? Yeah. And I got some also other great blurbs by Brian Fe uh, Freeman and uh, Ben Piercy. Uh, who I'm a big, huge fan of as well. So they all said very nice things about the book. I appreciate that. You know, for people who don't um, follow book blurbs or see a lot of relevance in them, uh, I have to disagree because I think uh, two things. One, it's your peers lifting you up, which is so sure. important in, in these days. And secondly, uh, to me, it's like uh, if I go to pick up a book quite often, I'll, I'll admit quite often, I will uh, pick up a book and go, oh, let's let's see what the other people are saying about it. And if there's some names that I recognize, like Almakatsu and Brian Freeman, golly, he's a new favorite. Right. Then I go, oh, well, then I definitely got to read it. Of course, I'm reading it anyway. But Todd, I want yeah. you to break, so break something down for me because this is, <clears throat> without sounding cliche, and I don't say this very often, I've only run across about three books this year that I can say definitively are different than anything else that I've read. Mm -hmm. David Ellis wrote a book called Look Closer, which if you haven't read it, I so highly recommend it. I know you got other things to do, but that's one. Number two is um, Adam Handby. He's on with The Other Side of Night, which is mind-blowing. Okay. And then this one. And so to get to the point is you integrate, and I remember our conversation Last year, you said uh, you wanted to, quote, pivot from harder crime novels about a cult told in a unique way with epistolary, which I, I, I'm, a, I'm a master's degree, but I didn't know what that was. <laughs> Come to find out it's fake news articles and so forth. Right. You'd always wanted to write about a cult. So first of all, two part, what made you want to write about a cult? And secondly, just come, give me a little bit of brief description as to the format, because there's a lot of things going on in this book. Yeah, I mean, the, the cult, the desire to write a book about a cult, I just always had that. I, I find, you know, cults, the, the mechanisms of cults, what draws people to cults fascinating. You know, I think that's as relevant now as, as any time, given, uh, you know, the, the interest that we're seeing in conspiracy theories and, and conspiracies and um, so it's just something I'd always wanted to kind of kind of delve into. And but I wanted to do it in a unique way. I mean, typically a book like this would have your kind of a present, you know, your a story in present tense or, or, or in a current time. And then you'd have kind of your B story flashbacks and things like that. And so that would have been a way to do it. It had been a perfectly credible, good way to do it. But I wanted to do something a little bit different and kind of challenge myself. And so instead of doing a traditional kind of flashback or, or B story narrative, all of the history of the cult is brought out in this kind of uh, unique epistolary way. So we've got newspaper articles from that time. We've got magazine articles. We've got FBI reports. We've got medical examiner's reports. We've got 
uh, script pages because this cult was somewhat famous uh, and movies were made about it. So we have the script pages from the script that was written, uh, you know, the, the movie that was made about this cult. And I, I wanted to do that because, you know, cults are, are they're puzzles, right? And I think I wanted this book to be a puzzle. So I wanted the reader to be able to go through and kind of check these pieces of all this information out there and kind of draw their own conclusions about what happened in the past, because it's not all the same. It doesn't quite all tell the same story. And I wanted the reader to kind of understand that over time, people's opinions about this cult, the people who are in the cult, the views of them have all changed as well. And, and kind of doing it with this kind of unique narrative was uh, a way to approach it. And it, it you know, it, it'll probably be polarizing. I mean, people are either going to like it or they're going to hate it, right? It, you just, I don't think you're going to be on the fence about it. And I knew that going into it. And I think uh, my editors and, and, and the good folks at Thomas and Mercer knew that as well. Uh, but I really thought it was a unique way of approaching a story um, that we've seen before. I mean, a cult book, there's nothing new about that. But I thought I packaged it in a little bit different way. Well, it, yeah, it is certainly packaged in a different way. And speaking of people who may or may not like uh, particular things about it, um, <laughs> my wife and I were talking over the weekend. She saw me reading the book as I was finishing it. And she said, uh, what's it about? Give me the shortest possible because she knows I'll ramble on forever. I'm like, OK, it's about a wacky cult. And she started laughing. I said, why are you laughing? She goes, oh, kind of like the uh, nonfiction book that you're writing. <laughs> which has to do with a similar topic yet under the guise of we'll we'll just use the word church. Right. <laughs> Read between the lines as you will. I will. <laughs> well, there was so much to like about the book and uh I I really dug the scene. I I dug I don't want to go any specifics cuz I don't like to ruin things. There's so many little nice surprises, but I like how you'll pop in and out. There's there's courtroom drama, then there's dialogue. You know, it starts off with the almost can I say this? It's the prologue feels almost like a three tier. You know, it starts and then it kind of starts again and then it starts mm -hmm. again and then and then it really starts. Right. And w w while it was starting, I'm like, "Oh, I'm in for a ride. I better buckle up." And uh, and then it actually started. So the thing that was so enjoyable about it, and I'd love for you to expand on this, mm -hmm. is the sh shifting timelines and coming in and out. And it, it forces the reader to to really s stay in tune. Right. Well, and, and it's interesting because I said not everyone's going to appreciate what I was trying to do with the book. And that's fine. I mean, I, I also wanted to challenge myself as well. I mean, this is my uh, fifth published book. Uh, so I wanted to do something different. I wanted to try to write in these, not just different character voices, but different styles. I mean, the, the, you know, the newspaper articles have to be much different than the narratives, right? The script pages are different than the other stuff. So it was kind of a fun challenge. It's not a challenge I'm eager to do again, quite honestly. This book was a bare to put together um, and, and, you know, making sure the timelines all lined up and, and through, through the course of the book, I changed the timelines a couple of different times, kind of expanding ages and changing ages as I was, you know, cutting characters and adding characters. But, you know, my own uh, mom uh, who, you know, likes my books generally, she didn't like this book. Right. So, you know, one of the first people to read it out of the box and she's like, yeah, she goes, I didn't like it. She goes, I couldn't understand it. She goes, I couldn't follow it. Too much stuff going on. Um, and you know, I think her reaction is not, uh, hopefully it will not be the standard reaction, but it wasn't surprising because it's not, it, it's not for everyone. I mean, you kind of have to approach it, uh, and actually kind of dig into it and, and not everyone wants to make their books a research project. You know, I hope the, the overall story is compelling enough that you can read it and, and, and drop, not even pay attention to some of that, uh, you know, ephemeral stuff and still get the general gist of the story. <clears throat> Not to continue to refer to my wife, but uh, <laughs> she said, uh, cause she knows how much I enjoyed our conversation a year ago with Lost River. And she knows how much I enjoyed that book. She goes, Oh, is it like Lost River? And I'm like, no, actually it's nothing like Lost River. <laughs> actually at all. 
No, yeah, it could not. The two books couldn't be any more different. And this really couldn't be any more different than the, than the three before Lost River. So, you know, it's always a risk when you try something different. Um, and, you know, I, again, I knew that. It's kind of a calculated risk. Uh, you know, I, you figure you probably lose some fans who will read this and be like, well, this is crap. This isn't a J. Todd Scott book. I, this isn't what I came for. Um, and then maybe you'll gain a, a few others, right? And, and I just think, Doing this for me is as much about challenging myself as it is just about selling books. So, you know, I, I can't write the same book over and over again. So I try to do something different with them all. Well, there's two things that come to my mind. First of all, I applaud you because I'm a big fan of authors, artists, as you are, to do something outside their comfort zone. I'm a big fan of that. I, I, I figure... My theory is if you're not constantly stretching yourself somehow, somewhere each time, then you're really just clocking a nine to five. And while it is a business and it does often require nine to five, we chose this dimension in which to travel because it spoke to us and it's off the beaten path. Sure. Sure. No. And, and look, it is a business and you can't write, you can't go off the beaten path the way I did with the with the flock and not understand that it, you know, the business may beat you, right. You know, if the, if the book doesn't work or it doesn't sell, well, then you put yourself back, uh, you know, at least a year, if not more, depending on, on kind of where you are in, in your career. Um, but, you know, for me to get up every day and write, it has to be something I, I want to write. And I have the flexibility to kind of, try some things. And if they don't work, well, then back up and try something else. So, Well, that leads me to my second point, And you just about touched it exactly. You said, quote from last year, and every book I write is a story I want to read myself. Yes. And you went on to say that you said, I have no problem crafting a book, whether it's 80, 100 or 150,000 words, put it in a box, stick it in a drawer because I did it for me. And I walked away, Todd, I walked away going, wow, now that's not only is that gutsy because of the uh, amount of time that's involved, but it's brave on its own level because you, you have to have the faith in you that you have something to say that perhaps hasn't been said, or it certainly hasn't been said the way you wanted to say it and that you just took the gamble. Yeah, no. And I, I think the, and we talked about this, uh, the last time around, you know, I, I think the first, you know, far empty, the first two books, I really wanted to prove that I could write, you know, having not written for so many years, having kind of started this late, I really wanted someone, another writer, Alma Katsu or somebody to say, you know what, that guy can really write. Uh, I'm probably self-conscious about wanting to prove that I can write. Now, several books into it, and I've written some other things and been brought on to write other things. You know, I feel like I can write. So I, each book is not an attempt to prove that I actually, you know, can sit down and, and craft a story. I, I know I can do that. Um, so now these are crafting stories that I want to read, that I enjoy writing and pushing um, my talent, you know, as limited as it may be, but pushing it into new places. So that way it's still enjoyable to sit down and, and, and do it every day. And again, I, you take risks. Um, sometimes they pan out. Uh, sometimes they do. Uh, but I think, you know, I could have written another book like Lost River, um, but it might not have expanded my audience. Right. It might not have reached new people. Uh, the same people who read Lost River probably would have loved it. But if I'm going to have some longevity at this, and then I think I have to owe it. I owe it to myself to try some different things, do some things, throw some darts at a dartboard and see and see what see what works. You've mentioned uh, moments ago about what was difficult about it, uh, keeping the timeline straight and the ages and the names. And there's so many different ancillary elements that weave into it. But and, and that can be a challenge. What was your favorite part? So what's that part that tickled your brain, that tickled that creative itch that you finally got to scratch, that you walked away going, wow, I this this part right here or this element right here is exactly what interested me the most. I think every time I could switch and try to write something in a completely different tone and voice, that was really, really uh, cool, for want of a, a better word, right? Yeah. 
I mean, you know, so to write a few chapters of kind of regular narrative and then suddenly write a New York Times like uh, news piece or a Vice news piece or uh, to write the script pages like I'd never seen that in a book before. Right. Um, so to, to be able to put that in there. So just kind of have these kind of unique uh, bits of of narrative and try to make each one so different and not sound like me mimicking something else. But for a casual reader, if you just pick it up and read like the FBI report, you're never going to know that that's not a real FBI report, right? Or read one of those news articles, you're never going to know, right? And then to think that a reader will go, you know what, let me go actually see if that's real, right? Let me go check some of these, um, you know, the, the newspaper articles that are referenced or magazines that are referenced. You know, how real is that? And, and so the idea that we kind of can send people off uh, down the rabbit hole looking for some of those things, right? Um, that was kind of exciting and fun and fun to do. Well, and let's let's stick on that for a second because you literally, you, you just about said what I was going to say. Um, I caught myself when I would hit a news article for a split second. And this is, this is the, one of the best compliments I can pay you. When you can pull me into a book and make me so immersed in that story that when I run across a news article and go, Jesus, did that really happen? Oh, that's okay. Yeah. Right. Because the voice has changed so systematically and, uh, and organically that I went, Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's just part of the fiction. So. Yeah. Right. And, and so much of it was real adjacent, right? Like I yeah. use that word talking to my editor, right? It's real adjacent. It's real sort of. Yeah. Right? yeah, yeah. So, so you know, this idea of, of birds falling from the sky, there are real newspaper articles about right that. So I could kind of mimic, get something close uh, to that, but in my own voice, um, you know, there's a lot of information out there about cults. So I wasn't having to create this stuff whole cloth, but uh, it was definitely fake, but just real enough that it would cause the reader to kind of, you know, like you did pause. And that's, yeah. and that's, what what you wanted and and that stuff matters because i mean it all does tell a story when you piece it all together but i really like this idea of the passage of time and what people consider truth because a lot of this book is about conspiracies and lies and truths and stuff like that well what you consider truth changes based on which of these things you read and believe because everyone who you know every person brought their own um, kind of biases or own opinions to this. The, the, you know, the FBI guy wrote his report. Is it the truth? It's his truth is he saw it at that moment. Newspaper person wrote their article, you know, about our cult leader. Well, that was his truth as he saw it when he was writing that article. So having filtering all these bits of epistolary information through the different truths of the people who was writing it, that to me was, uh, uh, it was a challenge, but that's kind of what made the whole, the whole thing work. The engine turn. Well, Todd, and not not for nothing, as they say, but when you look at the headlines, especially along the lines of, say, like the last president, mm -hmm. um, where the news appeared to be true from the viewpoint of whoever, whomever was speaking it. Right. No, exactly. And that's, you know, I, you know, I don't really write politics and this isn't a political book at all, but you couldn't have live through the last few years and not come away with some, um, you know, kind of opinions or thoughts about media and the way we consume media and social media, because that's reflected in here too, kind of the social media stuff that, you know, my cult uh, as portrayed here is very social media savvy and a lot of what they're doing is involved in that. So, uh, you know, that's a reflection of what I was seeing in the world around me too. And kind of wanted to make it real adjacent in my uh, book. It's so funny that you use the word real adjacent <clears throat> because when I was living in Hollywood the third time, <laughs> I was living in what we called Beverly Hills adjacent. <laughs> so in that in that particular time, I couldn't afford exactly Beverly Hills right. 90210, but we'll use this number. I think I was in 90211. Right, exactly. You know. <laughs> hey, where do you live, Dave? Uh, Beverly Hills adjacent. <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> right uh, across the parking lot from Beverly Hills. <laughs> I could see Beverly Hills from my window. Right. Yeah. Anyway, that made me think of that. I did want to ask this uh, because you've spent your in 
pretty pretty much your entire career at the DEA, you had to have spent you 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 had to have run across something, even a percentage like this. Tell me, yes. Yeah, and and obviously the sort of investigations that we do and the reports that we write are re- reflected in a, a lot of what you know you see in the flock from the investigative standpoint. Uh, you know, it's it's interesting. My books are sometimes classified as procedurals because they all have this element of investigation in them. They all kind of touch base on um, you know either a federal agent investigation or cop investigation. We have a cop here who. You know, one of the stories going on is she's investigating a murder. And so she's kind of tracking that down. And a lot of that's drawn on the sort of work that I've all that I've always done. Uh, I'm kind of trying to get my editor to buy into this idea of a horror procedural. So it's got cop stuff in it, but there's kind of this horror element as well, which this book has is, is got a little bit of that. Um, so, yeah, I, I, you know, all my books ultimately have that little bit of something that I've done in my career or that kind of procedural aspect or the cop law enforcement aspect, you know, um, because that's just what I know so well. So you can't write these books and not have that appear. Yeah. And speaking of which, and I don't want to get too far away from the flock, I'll stick, I'll come back to it, but I want to ask this because you said that you've just submitted, albeit late, your latest book. (laughs) Are you, sorry, I had to, are you, are you returning back to this, to your old style? Uh, And I don't want to say old style, like, um, uh, go back to what people are familiar with. I think, well, no, I definitely think the book I just turned in is closer, uh, in tone and style to Lost River or the, the Big Ben books than this one is. Very, very much so. Yeah. Um, and probably a little more thrillery than than pure cop or criminal procedure. Um, you know, it takes place over, uh, much like The Flock, though, it takes place over a short amount of time, but uh, it's got a really kind of propulsive plot and, uh, you know, a lot going on. It's got that some of that cop stuff that I put in there, um, but much more closer to, Lost River and the Big Ben books than than the flock, I'd say. Yeah. And the reason I bring that up, Todd, just for the chance of the the listeners and viewers who enjoy uh, what they generally read from you is that this is a wonderful, entertaining, engaging departure. Okay. And he's coming back. He's not, he's not, don't worry, folks. Todd, (laughs) Todd's not going anywhere. He he's simply stretching his wings. Get what I did there, and right. very good. Try, yeah, trying to do a little bit something different. That's all. And yeah. this is one of my biggest takeaways, Todd. And, and and I and I have to say this to myself constantly as I'm writing because oh my god, T- Tammy and I were just talking about this over the weekend. She goes, "What so far? What is one of the hardest things that you've learned over the last few years?" I said, "Getting this." Getting the voice that sits here on my shoulder and goes, you know, that's not really very good. You know, I, 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 what, you, you're really going to do that. You should just cut that up. You know, matter of fact, you, maybe you should just do something else. And not to be silly, but I mean, I got to fight that bitch all the time. No. I, I, yeah. And what I'm getting at is sometimes you have to just stretch and experiment and then come back and then go another direction. But that my bottom, bottom line is it's entertainment. We're spending six months to a year, whatever that span is, to create some entertainment. You enjoy it. And then you do something else. I mean, look, if you're going to do this professionally, then you can't completely ignore that voice because that voice actually has. Uh, some real authority behind it. It's going to be a publisher or it's going to be an editor. I mean, it's going to be all those things. Yeah. You know, if you just want to write uh, creatively, if you just want to write for yourself, then you can write anything you want as much as you want, whenever you want. Um, I could write a 200,000 page book about, you know, uh, the, my career. Nobody's going to buy it and nobody's going to, I'm not going to be able to sell it. But if I just want to write that, I could. And that's always different between being a writer and a, and a professional author. I think those, you know, we've talked about that before. I think those things are, are a little bit different. Um, so yeah, no matter, every time you start a new project, that voice is there. And I go into it knowing that a book could fail, but I also know going into it, it could succeed. And I, I, I've been at this business just enough to know that there almost is no way to predict. I mean, you, you know, you, you see books and they come out and they are amazing bestsellers. And, and you, you know, you read the back flap of that and you're like, how on earth would anyone have predicted this book, right, would 
sell 10 million copies or 12 million copies, right? right? And then you see books come out, but you're like, this is a surefire hit. I love it. I think it's great. And then it's, you know, sinks without a trace. So you can't necessarily be results oriented in this thing because you have, we're not given crystal balls. So if I'm going to spend nine months writing something, then it's got to be something I want to write knowing full well that it may be something somebody doesn't want to read. Um, and that to me is just kind of the deal with the devil you make. If you, if you live, you know, this life and, and write these books and do this stuff. So, right. Uh, and just a quick aside for those who are listening very closely and are scratching their heads. Uh, Todd said, if, uh, if you want to write a 200,000 page book and try to sell it, you can. And I think you meant 200,000 words, right? Yes. Yeah. 200,000 pages would really be a hell of a read. <laughs> yeah, 200,000 words. But the point is, is that there are market realities. That's sure. part of the business. And, you know, sometimes you just know there are things that you would say, I could write this, but I'm never going to be able to sell it, at least not traditionally or not not in the business model that, that most books will get sold. Maybe you self-publish it. Maybe you could serialize it. Maybe you could do any number of things, right? But, um, you know, the... The, that voice on your shoulder is there. And if you want to do this professionally, then you have to understand you're going to take uh, a few knocks along the way. Yeah. And let's touch on that self-pub idea for just a second, because you, while you are pu traditionally published through Thomas and Mercer, which to me, uh, which uh, Amazon, the, uh, the umbrella, top umbrella is self-publishing, which is how I do my stuff because I'm not in your league yet. My question is this. I was, I've been talking to some people lately and they go, I am swimming in both pools simultaneously. And I'm like, wow, that must be physically nearly impossible. But um, they said, you know, I'm represented with this book traditionally and then I still do some of my own projects self-published. What are your thoughts about that? I think that's great. And, and you know, however you can get your work out there. Um, you know, I have been with uh, Penguin Random House and Putnam. Those did my traditional crime novels. Thomas and Mercer has taken up the banner for uh, the flock uh, and the book after that. Although Thomas and Mercer is their crime, their crime, uh, you know, imprint. So anything that I, I, I had done with the Lost River would have fit comfortably under Thomas and Mercer. Their models are a little bit different. Uh, so I'll see, you know, I'll see when the flock comes out, uh, how it does and how it's marketed and, 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 and publicized stuff like that. I've been impressed with what I've seen so far. Uh, and I'm definitely not opposed to, you know, publishing my own stuff or, or serializing stuff on my website or do, doing any number of these, uh, things going with a small press. I've got a couple of books in a drawer. I would love to get out somewhere, uh, you know, uh, give to a small press, sell them for charity, any number of things to kind of get them out there. Uh, so I think whatever model you can make work for you, it, it's fine. The only reason I've kind of done it the way I have is because I have a day job. And so I don't have, frankly, the time, the interest or inclination to dig in and learn how to do it myself. So I've been extremely fortunate that I've had other people willing to do that on my behalf. Yeah. Um, but if I didn't, then I guess I would be uh, Googling, you know, how to publish your own book for dummies sort of thing and, and go from there because a lot of people have been tremendously successful that way. So, you know, it's kind of however you can get your art out there in front mm. of folks. That's what you want. I can tell you this. It is not easy. You have to be, as they used to say, you have to be the waiter, the chef, the bottle washer. You got to do it all. You right. got to know a little bit about advertising, marketing, have the savvy to do it, a little bit extra money to do it, the time to do it the inclination to do it, the social media pitch. Now, uh, other side of that coin is, and this is standard news to everyone, is if you're traditionally published, you're, you know, your publisher, editor, agent, they're all going to say to you, you know, you got to kind of carry a little bit of this weight yourself too, Todd. You right. know, we're not doing everything for you, right? Right. No, and I, I try to maintain an active social media presence. Uh, that helps, I think. I mean, if I put pictures of bourbon I'm drinking or dogs up there, that seems to work real well. Uh, pictures of me don't seem to move much product. But and I try very hard on social media. I actually use it more of a vehicle to support other writers and, and, and books that I'm reading. You know, try to keep it minimal, my own stuff and, and a lot other people, um, because I, I really do want to. I've been have had great support. So I try to, to pay that back. 
So to me, that's kind of what I offer. I mean, I'll get on, uh, you know, anytime my publisher wants to send me somewhere or put me on a radio, I'm happy to do that, make myself available. And I, you know, maintain a constant presence on, on social media and support other writers, blurb other books. You know, I uh, have hosted writers at the Poison Pen for when they've had stuff coming out. So I kind of feel like I do my part. But yeah, in today's modern publishing, no matter who's publishing you, their expectation is you get out there and help sell your own stuff. Well, I, I want to say a thank you to you because you have been so good to the Thriller Zone by uh, promoting both uh, when you're coming up, promoting our show, promoting other people through our show. I mean, I've said this before. One of the, my favorite things about this Thriller community is the fact that everyone is working together to raise all boats. And it's pretty dang awesome. Yeah, no, it, it, everyone's, I have not met a negative person yet in, mm. in my experience. Now, I'm sure they're out there, but that hasn't been my experience. Um, so everyone's been very welcoming, very supportive. You know, this isn't a zero sum game. I mean, we really can all be successful at this and I want other people to be successful uh, because if somebody reads Alma's books, well, maybe they'll read mine as well and, and vice versa. Um, and there's a lot of people reading Alma's books. So if you like Alma Katsu, read the flock as well so <laughs> see i did some marketing there i tried there you, folks take a lesson from todd just watch this greatness right in front of you <laughs> oh but no it's been a great uh community i've had a lot of writers support me and i hope i can do the same for other writers as well i try to yeah you do this is pure magic by the way, quick question. You mentioned you have mentioned D we've mentioned DEA a couple of times. How long do you think? How many more years do you think you're going to work until you finally hang up the badge and say, "You know what? I'm all in 100% of the time and or retire." What do you think? Well, I'm I'm mandatory um before too long. I'll put it that way. DEA does have a mandatory retirement for guys in my position, so the end is coming. Uh, my family would like me to retire yesterday and have been very vocal about that. They've been pushing, <laughs> pushing hard. Uh, so it's, uh, yeah, it's coming. I probably sooner rather than, than later. I well, God, say. you said that last time. No, I know. I know. Now here we are a year, a, a year later, but, yeah. uh, you know, I, I got to do some interesting stuff this summer, uh, worked out in Hollywood for a bit and, and really enjoyed that. So I think, uh, as more opportunities like that pop up, I'll probably uh, finally hang it up and do this, do this full time. Can you tell me what that was going on in Hollywood? Yeah, I, I don't know. I can give a, a lot of the specifics, but uh, I was brought in to work on uh, one of these uh, TV series in the Taylor Sheridan world, the Yellowstone world. So yep. uh, 1883 came out, I guess, a year or so ago. This is a uh, kind of a sequel to that. It's 1883, the Bass Reeves story. It's about a, a black, uh, you know, deputy marshal, federal marshal uh, back in the 1800s. Real, real person, fascinating person. Uh, but this is kind of part of the Yellowstone empire. And I was brought out to uh, work in a writer's room for, for a bit and, and kind of uh, consult uh, on that and got to, um, you know, help out with the, planning the, the season to six episode miniseries. Um, and there are now location scouting, casting, doing all that stuff. It'll be out next spring. Um, I got to write a script all on my own, which was great. Uh, yeah. so, uh, one of the episodes will be all mine, uh, but it was a great experience to collaborate with, with people who write, you know, drama, dramatic television, you know, and film, uh, for a living. I learned a tremendous amount. feel very fortunate I got to be involved. And uh, obviously, more will be coming out that in the, in the next few months. I can't give away plot details, but I sure. can say I, I got involved in that. And it was great. I feel very, very fortunate to do that. Well, I'm going to tell you, I'm, I'll just say it. I'm big time jealous because that, that world, I love that world, having dabbled in it over the decades. And to, but I haven't dabbled in it from this direction as a writer of fiction through television. But I, I do want to ask this kind of a, what was your favorite part and what's one really great takeaway that you took when writing for television, which is different than writing oh, yeah. for a book. What's, what's one good little juicy morsel that you took away, which is going to tee you up to my next question that my listeners can go, Oh, 
There is a seismic difference between television writing and fiction writing. Yeah, I mean, there's a, a ton of dis differences, all seismic. I mean, one of the things that was new for me was the collaboration. You know, you're sitting in a, in a writer's room working with tremendous writers, all pitching these ideas, trying to put uh, a story together. And, you know, there were, as a, someone who spent so much time writing his own books, I'm not used to losing battles, right? Like, uh, you know, so dis but decisions have to be made for a million reasons. Um, and I'm just one voice there. So kind of listening to other writers, how they think, how they create, you know, the, the kind of immediacy of, all right, we need to pitch an idea for episode four, you know, the first act. And then, all right, you two go into a room and write a first act, you know, that kind of ability to create and write on demand in a yeah. very time sensitive, fast way in something that's good. Um, was obviously a change from sitting kind of in my, you know, room up here on my own in the dark, writing, writing my books, um, plus having the immediacy of uh, critique and criticism, all positive. But, you know, you're literally on the spot and you're throwing out ideas and you're throwing out dialogue and you can see a room of people staring at you saying, yeah, that's going to work or that's not going to work. Or maybe, maybe it'll work. We'll think about it. And then, you know, putting your... Uh, outlines together and eventually writing the script and all the people who weigh in on it. And I think that's the other big takeaway from this sort of, of, of writing is not only are you working with the writer's room, you're working with the showrunner, you're working with the producers, you're working with the network, you're working in the studio. There's a lot of people, you know, the actors, uh, you have a lot of people who have a say in what ultimately ends up. So you can't be precious about your writing. I mean, it really is. Yeah, there's the art part of it, but there really is a business and it's an expensive business and they're trying to get something up on the screen. And so, um, you know, there were no hill I was worth dying over, you know, in the writer's room. I would give my idea. If you liked it, great. If you didn't, uh, you know, that, that's OK. And just be able to write well, fast and then make changes fast. fast. And then just understand that, you know, it's you're just one voice. And, you know, for us creative types, that can be hard to kind of give up that control. But that's, you know, you understand pretty quickly on a massive production like that, that, you know, they're not going to hold up the world, uh, you know, for you. So, right. you know, if something's got to be written and you got to write it, turn it in. If you can't, then stand aside and let somebody else write it. So it, it really is a, a business. It's a creative business, but it's still a business. Well, one of the things I've always liked about you in the short time that we've got to know each other is the fact that you um, you got a pretty thick skin. You're in a well, you're in a job that uh, doesn't take lightly to prancing around, uh, taking lots of people's opinions. And let me think about that. And well, you seem like a nice guy, but I mean, you, you don't deal in that world, so you're you're kind of accustomed to uh, hey, bada bing, bada boom. You like it, great. You don't, okay, let's move on. And so that works well for you, doesn't it? Yeah, it did. And I, you know, again, I also have the, the backstop of my, I have my own books that I write. So, if, you know, if I really want to write something myself, well, I have my own books to do that. Yeah. But in a series like that, I was brought on to do a job. And so I'm going to do it the best that I can and give them my opinions. That's what I'm paid for, but not going to get too upset and not going to get offended, you know, and you have to just expect your work is going to be changed, right? I mean, you yeah. can write the best piece of dialogue in the world, but maybe it's just not going to work for the series or trying yeah. to write in that very, you know, economical space where you've got, you know, for an hour of television, you're maybe looking at a 47, 48 page script and there's stuff that would work wonderfully in a novel scenes that you just absolutely fall in love with. But for the narrative uh, of a TV series that just the scenes, they just don't matter. Yeah. So uh, you're going to have to be prepared to watch those scenes, hit the editing floor and, um, you know, and just move on to the, move on to the next thing. Well, to make it even a little more personal than that, if you will allow me, uh, it was the early nineties, probably 92, 93. I was on a TV series and I had been called to do the scene. I did the scene. It took, uh, you know, a better part of a day. I couldn't wait, mm -hmm. you know, a few day, uh, months went by for the edit, finally gathered the family around the TV, getting ready to watch it. It comes and it's like half of the scene. And I'm like, well, it was a whole lot longer than that, folks. I don't understand what happened. And I was like, what? And then it kicks into the, oh, was I bad? Did it? And then I, uh, weeks later, weeks later, I bumped into one of the producers and they said, oh, dude, uh, we ran, 
short on time. Uh, something had to go. What you had said in the scene was kind of already said. Everything else was kind of gravy. So we just cut out the gravy and kept going. Not a big right. deal. And I learned a very valuable lesson right there is, oh, OK, that's just how it goes. So to your point, <laughs> you got to be in the place where you got the thick skinny go. Hey, it's just part of the process. One little piece of cog in the wheel. As right. long as the wheel is going and you're even in the vicinity, all good. Right. And, and I said, I was very fortunate uh, to be brought in on this. Uh, and, and so I was, again, very fortunate. I worked with great writers uh, who, you know, do this for a living. Right. And so I wasn't I was going to be the last person to sit in that room and tell people, you know, how to do how to do their job. Uh, yeah. I was the only novelist there. Uh, but they had all had, you know, much more expansive TV and feature film experience than me. Um, and it's just a different type of writing. And I enjoyed it. I, I mean, I absolutely enjoyed it. But it is very different than sitting, crafting your own novel, um, you know, kind of at your own timeline and, and your own pace. Uh, sure. All right. As we get to start to wrap up, I, I close with that my standing question, as you may or may not recall from last year, I want to see what further enlightenment perhaps has come your way over these last 12 months. Uh, but for aspiring writers particularly, I'd love to find out what's your best piece of advice. I've said this before, and I, I think uh, I'll just come back to it again. Um, you can't be overly precious with your writing. And, and I know that that slowed me down in the beginning, right? Like I wanted it always to be perfect. I wanted the muse to show up. I wanted, you know, I just kind of thought it was magical and, and maybe it is for some writers, but writing isn't magical for me. It, it's not. I mean, it's fun. Uh, it's challenging. It's a lot of things, but it's not magical. It's just work for me. And, you know, to treat it like that, um, to understand that it's going to be fits, you know, stops and starts. You're going to go down dead ends. You're going to write pages that, you know, for me, a lot of mornings, I'm like, this is dribble. I hate this. This is, this is horrible. Right. But just to keep at it and at it and don't let don't let the mundane, you know, don't let the mundaneness, if that's the word of it, undermine the work and the creativity that you're doing, because the creativity will will be there. Right. When you're all said and done, that piece is going to be creative. It's going to be you. It's going to reflect everything about you uh, or everything about the story you're wanting to tell. But in the moment, that particular sentence you're writing, that particular paragraph or page there may be nothing magical, creative, or mesmerizing about any of that, um, but that's okay, right? It, it happens over time to not be afraid to try stuff, not be afraid to fail, and not be afraid to throw pages away and start over again because that's just how it, that's how it's worked for me. Man, that's just flat out good stuff right there. Well, as we get to wrap, you know, we got to do a little bit of rapid fire questions. Yes. And this, this one's going to be fun. Only three of them. Right. So uh, you are suddenly called out of town on a case much like the one in this delicious read called The Flock, in case you didn't catch it earlier. Mm -hmm. And you are so glad that you have packed three things. They can be for serious, for shizzles, for giggles, whatever. <laughs> what are they? Uh, definitely... A uh, backup gun, a uh, bottle of bourbon, and probably a J. Todd Scott novel because <laughs> nothing kills time like one of my books. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so good. Okay. you. All right. On the other side of that, you solved the case, put away the bad guys, received a medal. You've been given a month of vacation. Retirement is still quite a ways away. Your stack of cash for all your troubles. Where will you go for a month and what will you do? You know, as cliched as it sounds, I would probably go to the beach for a month. I enjoy going and sitting out on the beach. I'm definitely afraid of sharks, so I won't get in the water. Um, <laughs> but I don't need to get in the water. I'm quite content to sit on the sand, get some sun, have a few drinks. Yeah. And watch the beach. I find that very relaxing. So yeah. absolutely, I'd go to the beach. It's so good. We we live literally one mile as the crow flies from the beach, and there's nothing in the world. Tammy and I take a walk every day. Go down and walk. There's something about just being near that water that leisure allows your mind to just chill. 
Right. When I first started uh, DEA, I was out in Los Angeles and I lived right there off of PCH in a tiny little uh, apartment right on the beach. Uh, you could walk out. They had the Budweiser beach volleyball stuff going on. Uh -huh. And uh, that was great. Just being able to walk out anytime, day or night and stand out by the ocean. I really enjoyed that. So, yeah. And that teeny tiny little 600 square foot apartment today, you could probably get for a measly four grand. Oh, yeah. No, I, well, I couldn't even afford it then. Uh, it was so embarrassing. But, uh, you know, someone who lived in landlocked Kentucky uh, to go out there and be at a, on the beach with my mullet and shoulder holster like uh, <laughs> Miami Vice, I wasn't going to pass that up. God, I remember that from last time we yep. talked. <laughs> I'm just trying to imagine you try to pull off that look. Oh, I didn't pull it off. That's the shame of it. <laughs> yeah. But I did it proudly anyway. <laughs> All right, third and final. Then after your break, you come back from your vacay. I'm coming to your town, and we're going to do a sit-down podcast with you, me, and two people. You get to invite, living or dead, that you'd like to discover whatever, discuss whatever the hell you want to. So it's you, me, and two people. Who would you choose and why? Uh, I would choose, actually, uh, I don't know if you know Philip Fracasi. I'm probably pronouncing his right name wrong. He's got a, actually a part podcast of his own called The Dark Word, but oh. he's a horror author. He's done a lot of interesting books. Uh, I read one of his books recently. I blurbed it, as a matter of fact. And again, he and I have emailed a text, but I've never had to say his name out, out loud, right? <laughs> um, but uh, I think Philip is doing some really, really interesting work, and he's kind of having a moment. So uh, a lot of his stuff is, I think, getting optioned, and he's got some great books coming up. So he is definitely someone that I would want to sit down and chat with. The, the book that he's uh, got coming out, Child Alone with Strangers. Um, oh, wow. that, that's due for Philip coming out soon, and I really, really enjoyed it. If you like uh, Stephen King, uh, I think it's very reminiscent of that in, a, in all the best ways. So Philip would be somebody I'd like to sit down with. And the new coach of University of Louisville basketball, Kenny Payne. Uh, I'm a sports junkie, so I'd like to sit down and pick his brain about the upcoming uh, basketball season, see where we are. I feel like we're a little thin on point guard. Uh, <laughs> my point guard days are way past me. But you could not get probably two any more uh, different individuals. Yeah. But uh, those are two. I'd like to talk to Philip about his books and Kenny about uh, current basketball strategy, because probably if I wasn't doing this, I'd love to be a coach. So, well, let me tell you something. Having spent 25 years in major market radio all around the world and then doing podcasting here in my uh, retirement years, mm -hmm. there's nothing better than this. And I hope it shows every day because I love talking to guys like you about anything we want to that is not only informational and educational, but hopefully somewhere along the line, inspirational. Yeah, no, I, I thank you for having me. I love every conversation that we have. You've got great guests. You've got a great, great series here. Uh, hopefully I'll be able to come back uh, every year. Oh, absolutely. Matter of fact, go ahead, just like we did last year, uh, celebrating yet again an anniversary. When will the next book drop and do you have a title? And I know you don't have a cover yet because you just sent the no, thing. No, in, I don't. So this the, the flock actually is will be out the first week of October everywhere. So that's coming out. The okay. book I just turned in is called Call the Dark, and that should be out about this time next year, assuming my editor likes it, which I guess we'll find out here before too long. She's seen bits and pieces of it. This is the first time she's seen the monster put together, uh, so we'll see see what she says. But it should be out next uh, next fall. So here's what we're gonna here's what we're gonna do. One year from now. Or as close to it as possible. We're going to find out that your weight has actually dropped, not ra risen. Your eyesight has improved. Your bourbon consumption has remained steady. And you're going to have <laughs> another hit on your hands. I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> Folks, once again, the book is The Flock. It's J. Todd Scott. Go to his website, jtoddscott.com. And once again, dude, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Take care. It's always good to see old friends come back around and see their latest work. And J. Todd Scott's The Flock, <laughs> congratulations. We're anticipating a huge release. Now, next week, can you believe it's already October? Speaking of how time flies, October already? Starting next Thursday, we're kicking off a new month. And boy, 
I got a chance to meet this guy at Thriller Fest, and he's a mad talent. Riley Sager, the house across the lake. This, I have just begun, and it's pulling me in ever so delicately with thrills and chills, where if you know anything about the Thriller Zone, we are your front row seat to the best thriller writers in the world, and he's one of them. So stay tuned for Riley Sager and the house across the lake. Quick little piece of business before we head on out, I want to say thank you to our sponsors, AuthorBytes.com, who helped build our website, David Temple Books, and can build your website, especially if you're an author. That's their specialty. And to Warwicks.com, a bookstore that's been around a long, long time. They're based in La Jolla, California, but you can find them anywhere in the world at Warwicks.com. Customer service is their brand. All right. So thank you so much for supporting the show. And you can support our show. Do me a favor. Go wherever you listen to your podcast. Tell us how you like the show. Make sure you subscribe at youtube.com slash the thriller zone. There's a little red button. You click subscribe. That way you're in touch with us every time a new episode drops. All right. I got some reading to do, so I'm going to bail on out of here. As always, I'm your host, David Temple, and I'll see you next time for another edition of the thriller zone. Yeah.